Hello everyone, my name is Atuk Sagi and I'm the owner of Team Ass Academy and today we'll be doing Unit 3, Circular Motion from AP Physics 1. Now if you haven't already, go to the description right now and get my free AP Physics 1 book. That book has everything you need to know to get a 5 and an A in your class. It has so many practice problems, so many free response questions and I believe that it will help many of you guys. So let's get started. So, what is the Uniform Circular Motion? Well, by the name, you can probably tell that this motion happens in a circular path. The object that undergoes UCM, which is a uniform circular motion, must do it at constant speed. The velocity of that object will be tangent to the circle that it makes, as, as you can see in this diagram below, in the bottom left. The acceleration is known as centripetal acceleration, and it points towards the center of the circle. If someone asks you, what is the role of centripetal acceleration? Then, you can say that centripetal acceleration, although it does not change the speed of the object in uniform circular motion, it changes the direction. That is the role of centripetal acceleration. It's what causes the object to move in a circle instead of going in a straight line. And the formula for centripetal acceleration is known as v squared over r, which is velocity squared over the radius of the path that the object makes. Now, centripetal force. So, we know that force and acceleration point in the same direction. And if centripetal force, I mean centripetal acceleration points inwards, then the force must also point inwards. And this force is known as centripetal force. And for an object in circular motion with mass m, velocity v, and radius r, we can find the force as mv squared over r. Now, let's pause for a second. This is a place for a lot of confusion. What causes centripetal force? Many people think that centripetal force is a fundamental force like gravitational force or tension force. But you have to remember that centripetal force is a concept. It is a formal label that we give to the net force that points towards the circle. The centripetal force is not an actual force. It is just the net force of an object that undergoes circular motion. It is a centripetal force is caused by other forces such as the normal force, tension, gravity, and even friction. In simple words, it is just the net force. And on a free body diagram, never mark an arrow with centripetal force. Never. Now, gravitational force. So at large distances, the dominant force will be gravitational force. It is a very, very, very strong force at, at very large distances. Now remember that gravitational force occurs between objects with masses, and it is always an attractive force. It can never be a repulsive force. And now, Gravitational force is found by using the mass of both objects that you're finding the force between and the distance between them. And this is the formula known as the universal law of gravitation. Fg equals to G, capital G, not lowercase g. This is not the G that we use, which is 9.8. This is a different G, times m1, times m2, over r squared. So how do we find gravitational field? Now, using our formula of gravitational force, we can find the field. We need to fire, first find the gravitational force on the test object and the mass of the test object. And note that lowercase g represents gravitational field in general. But on Earth, this value of g is 9.8. So now, to find gravitational field, we write out our equation. F net equals to M1 times A, where M1 is the mass of the test object. And then we know that the force is G M1, M2 over R squared. 
Now we divide both sides by m1, and we find that the gravitational field is g m2 over r squared. Clearly, gravitational field does not depend on the test object's mass because m1 is not in the formula for it. So inertial versus gravitational mass. Both inertia and gravitational mass, they both represent the same quantity, but the way they are measured are completely different. We already know that inertia in general is the tendency for, of an object to stay at rest. Inertial mass is found using Newton's second law. You can apply a force on an object and then measure its acceleration. Now if you divide the acceleration from the force, then we know that we will get the inertial mass. But for gravitational mass, we find it by objects moving due to gravity. We can use Newton's law of gravitation to find the gravitational mass. So now let's practice with some free response questions. A box of mass m held in place by friction rides on a flat bed of a truck which is traveling with constant speed v. Now this constant part should already remind us of circular motion, uniform circular motion. Now the truck is on an unbanked circular roadway having radius of curvature r. So now this problem basically has a truck and a box on top and both are moving in a circle. And the box is on the truck. It's not sliding off because of friction preventing it from. And now part A of the problem. On the diagram provided above, identicate, indicate, and clearly label all the force vectors acting on the box. So now clearly there will be three forces, a normal force, gravitational force, and friction force. Normal force points upwards, gravitational force points downwards, and friction force points to the right. Now, it asks us to find what condition that must be satisfied by the coefficient of static friction mu between the box and the truck bed. And then we express our answers in terms, in terms of V, R, and G. We know that friction force is what drives the circular motion. So friction force equals to, is like, the, it's driving the centripetal force. It's the cause of the centripetal force. So friction force equals to mv squared over r. In the y direction, we know that normal force balances out gravitational force. So n minus mg equals zero. In general, for gravity, we know that gravity is less than or equal to mu of n. So we write that inequality. We substitute it in to the first equation, which is the equation force of friction equals to mv squared over r. Now, after we substitute mv squared over r instead for friction, then we get mv squared over r is less than and equal to mu n. Now, from the f of y equation, we know that n minus mg equals 0, which means n minus, I mean n equals to mg. We now substitute n equals to mg in. And that gives us mv squared over r equals to mu mg. And now, now, if the roadway is properly banked, the box will still remain in place on the truck for the same speed, v, even when the truck bed is frictionless. On the diagram above, indicate and clearly label the two forces acting on the box under these conditions. So now, if the roadway is banked, there will, of course, there will be normal force. And since it's banked, it's on an angle, the normal force always points perpendicular to the surface. So if the car is at this angle, the normal force is also at an angle, and then gravitational force will be downwards. Now, which, if either of the two forces acting on the box, is greater in magnitude? So if we look back at our free body diagram, we know that there must be no motion in the y direction. And that means the vertical component of normal force must balance out gravitational force. And that means, since just one component of normal force equals to the gravitational force, there will also be a horizontal component of normal force that drives the circular motion, and clearly, the normal force will be larger in magnitude. Now our second FRQ, a ball attached to a string of length L 
swings in a horizontal circle as shown above with a constant speed. The string makes an angle theta with the vertical and t's the magnitude of the tension in the string. Express your answers to the following in terms of the given quantities and fundamental concepts. So now part A. On the figure below, draw and label vectors to represent all the forces acting on the ball when it is at the position shown in the diagram. The lengths of the vectors should be consistent with the relative magnitudes of the force. So this means that not only must we write the forces, like label the forces in the right direction, but the lengths of it should convey which one's larger and which one's smaller. For example, if we know a certain force is larger in magnitude, the, the force arrow, the vector arrow for that should be longer. So now, there's only going to be two forces on this object. Now, tension force which points diagonally and gravitational force which points straight. Now, the next part is to find the mass and the speed of the ball. So in the y direction, we know that the vertical component of tension will balance out the gravitational force, which means that T cosine theta equals mg. And in the x direction, the T sine theta, which is the horizontal component, that will be driving the circular motion. So it equals to mb squared over r. Now, this is a bit tricky, but the radius is not L. The radius of the circular path will not be L. L is the length of the actual string, but this is the axis and this is the string, which means we must find the right component and that will be the radius. And since we want the horizontal component for the length, for the length of the string, it's L sine theta and that's our radius. So we now plug that in into our equation for f of x to find that t sine theta equals to mv squared over L sine theta. And from f of y, we can simplify that to get t equals to mg over cosine theta. And since we know that t equals to mg over cosine theta, we plug that in. We plug that into our other equation, which is t sine theta equals mv squared over L sine theta. And then we know that sine theta over cosine theta is tan theta. So we're left with mg tan theta equals mv squared over L sine theta. We cancel out m from both sides. And we simplify it to get v squared equals to gl sine theta times tan theta. And now, we can take the square root of both sides to find that v equals to the square root of gl sine theta times tan theta. Now, if you want now to find the mass of the object, remember, when we wrote the equation for this, we found out that the vertical component of tension, which was t cosine theta, it balanced out the gravitational force. And that means t cosine theta equals mg. Now, if we divide g from both sides, we find that the mass is t cosine theta over g. And now we got the mass 